Good morning, church. Uh, today's Bible reading is, first Bible reading, is Daniel 7, 9 to 14. Yes, that's correct. As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head was white set wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The courts was convinced and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but an extension of life was granted to them for a certain period of time. I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and he will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. My name is Francie. I'm going to pray for us today. And uh, if you're in agreement um, at the end of this prayer, please do um, say amen with me. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for the glorious grace that you've poured out onto us. You are so rich in kindness and grace that you purchased our freedom with the blood of your Son, and forgave our sins. Thank you for uniting us with Christ and with each other. Thank you for loving us and choosing us in Christ before even the world was made, choosing us to be holy and without fault in your eyes. Thank you for preparing good works for us to do. However, righteous Father, um, we've sinned. We've fallen short this week in, in many ways. And we've not loved you with our whole heart or our neighbour as ourself. We're sorry and we turn away from our sin. Please flood our hearts with light so that we would understand the confident hope that you've given us and the incredible power at work in us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Sovereign Lord, we pray now for the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who are in fear that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. And Lord, we pray for those in power over war, those uh, with the power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, compassion to guide their decisions. We ask that you would hold and protect your people there. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Kids, it's now time for the kids' song. So I'd love to invite you all. Hello again. Uh, the second Bible reading Tim will be preaching on today is Revelations 1, 9 to 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus, was in the islands called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet, saying, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pragmas, Tyrannus, Sardis, Philadelphia, and 
well said Osia. Then I turned to see those voice. It was written and spoke to me. When I turned and saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like a fine bronze, as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading water. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came to his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write that you have seen what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. If I haven't met you before, it's wonderful to be here uh, with you. A uh, special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. It's great to have you with us as well. Uh, we are going to be continuing through our series on Revelation. If I could ask you to keep Revelation chapter 1 open in front of you so you can see it, we're actually going to read through some of it together. If you can see it, you're find it, going to find it a whole lot easy to follow along. I know some people appreciate taking notes. You're welcome to do that if that helps you uh, to engage. It's really nice to see some faces uh, today. Uh, just to uh, reiterate, in case you missed Joash's announcement, masks are no longer required indoors, though you are very welcome to wear them if you would like. Uh, how about I pray for us and uh, we'll begin. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness to us, that you've given us your word and your spirit. And so, Father, we ask that your word might, in the power of your spirit, might transform us this day. Father, give us ears to hear, open our minds to understand, open our hearts to receive your truth. And Father, we open our lives to you, that you might do with them what you will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends... One of the things the Bible makes clear is that for those of you who follow Jesus, you will find yourself at odds with the world, as Christ himself was. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, Jesus says, John 15. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. That's Jesus again, Matthew 10. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted to Timothy 3. And even though the Bible clearly prepares us for persecution that may come on account of our faith, I still find the prospect pretty terrifying. How about you? I know some of you here have done it tough for following Jesus. You've endured scorn from your family or from friends and I know some of you here may never again return to the place of your birth because you chose to follow Jesus. But even if it's not that extreme, for most of us, I think there's some, to some extent we'll all experience it. And I find the prospect pretty daunting. Uh, this week I attended a, um, a seminar, it was an online seminar run for pastors uh, by a group called the Human Rights Law Alliance. In fact, I've got a little picture there of, uh, of them. They're a, a group of Christian lawyers who advocate for, around issues of freedom of faith. And um, the, the topic of the seminar was pastoring under anti-Christian laws. Uh, that is, laws that make it hard to be a Christian or teach the things that the Bible teaches. 
and they raised a, a, a number of laws that uh, often are ideologically driven and deliberately seem to be targeting churches and religious organisations. But I've got to tell you, the result of attending that, it ended up being a bit of a fear campaign because I think we all left a little rattled. There was a lot of nervousness, and this is from church leaders, about the penalties for saying and doing and even praying certain things. That fear of persecution that even a room full of church leaders, well, we all felt it. You know, a couple of years ago, we had a young woman who was part of our church who had a genuine fear that Australia was going to be taken over by religious extremists. Think about ISIS rolling in on their trucks and that she'd be forced to marry uh, a terrorist. That, that was a, a tremendous fear that she had. I thought that was pretty unlikely, but she wouldn't sleep out of fear of that happening, all because she was a Christian. Friends, when we, fear, when we feel the pressure come, when we're afraid of opposition or persecution, when you get that lingering fear grinding in your guts, can I recommend you read the book of Revelation? Because it was written to churches in exactly that situation. Under threat from the powers and the rulers of this world, and they are terrifying. And to them, to those Christians, those churches under pressure, Jesus reveals a window into the cosmic realities at work in our universe that the churches might have missed in their scared and timid state. And I think maybe we miss too. To a church intimidated by the world, a glimpse is given of the risen and reigning Jesus. I've got three points I want to make t today. The first one is partnership in affliction. Partnership in affliction. If you've got your Bibles there, I just want to read out verse 9 and I want you to follow along. I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The author of this letter. His name is John. We met him last week. Those of you who are here, when we look at the first part of this chapter, he introduces himself, did you notice, not as the great apostle, the one whom Jesus loved, but as your brother and partner in the affliction and in the kingdom and in the endurance that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, from one battler to another, from one persecuted to another, from one who's feeling the pressure to another who's feeling the pressure. We're in this together. We're brothers and partners. And John describes his own experience. He was exiled to the island of Patmos because of the word of God and because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to Google the island of Patmos, here's the sort of pictures uh, that would come up. And you probably think to yourself, that doesn't look like that bad a place to be exiled to. And um, I don't know, maybe you've been there or to some of the other Greek islands. They are beautiful. Though down, uh, it's doubtful that in John's day they were the tourist hub they are now. But evidently, because of the preaching Christ... The Roman Empire and their infinite wisdom, they didn't want to make a martyr out of John. That hasn't worked in the past. So instead they just sent him away to an island where he can't preach Christ anymore, where he'll stop causing trouble. John knows what it's like to have to leave his home, his friends, his family that he will never see again. And while he's on that island, he hears a loud voice look with me at verses 10 and 11 i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches ephesus smyrna pergamum thyatira sardis philadelphia and laodicea the lord's day that that may very well just refer to sunday or it might be easter or in fact, we're not quite sure what, it may, what John means by being in the spirit. Maybe he was worshipping, maybe praying, perhaps just meditating. When he hears behind him a loud voice like a trumpet, which is the way that God's voice is described in the Old Testament, like a trumpet, and the voice says, write what you see and send it to the seven churches, the seven churches in Asia. I've got a map there. I shared it with you uh, last week. It's too small to read, I'm sorry. But, uh, that's, but that, those are red circles. Those are the seven churches 
And you can see Patmos is in the uh, purple circle. You can see where that is as well. Now, some nefarious people, sadly from our church, have suggested that the reason we're doing the book of Revelation is so that I can show photos from my 2016 study tour to Greece and Turkey. That is categorically untrue. However, what a great opportunity uh, to share some photos uh, from when I got to visit uh, this place. And I, just as a little teaser, I've got one to share with you. So this is me uh, standing at, 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 at just south of the Church of Laodicea and Heropolis. Uh, in fact, if you go to the next slide, Simeon, there's one without me. Um, in, the, in what's called the Lycan Valley, where these seven churches are. And I just wanted to show you that because I think sometimes we think uh, Bible places equal deserts with uh, random oases. But actually, have a look at this photo. This is a beautiful, beautiful place. It's stunning. The mountainside is absolutely glorious. And you can take, take that as a little teaser, a taster of uh, what we might have a look at over the coming weeks. You can take that down, Simeon. However, I do want you to notice here that this letter, this revelation is given, is written to these seven church, to the seven churches. These seven churches. It is not primarily to 21st century Christians to predict the outcome of the United States federal elections. It has massive implications for us, that's why God left it in the Bible for our instructions, but it is for, first and foremost to them, those seven churches. And I think that can save you a lot of big mistakes as this revelation unfold, unfolds, if you remember that. First thing to note, this is written to those who are enduring affliction by one who himself is enduring affliction. John hears a voice. He turns around to see who it was who was speaking and what he sees terrifies him. Point number two, the divine man. The divine man. Have a look with me, verses 12 and 13. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. John spins around. First thing he sees, lampstands. Probably not what he expected. Israel was described in the book of Zechariah as being a lampstand. There are seven of them, and you remember last week we learned that seven is a symbolic number. It symbolizes perfection or completeness. Now, I wonder if you can tell me, if you're an ancient Israelite, where would you go if you wanted to see lampstands? Can anyone tell me? This is a real-life tell me the answer. Anyone want to have a guess? You're probably right if you want to have a guess. Yeah, at the temple. Yes! Yes! And this is why the figure in the midst of these lampstands is dressed like a priest. Do you notice that? With a robe, with a sash. He is described as one like the Son of Man. Now, that can just mean a human. So God says to Ezekiel, Son of Man, get on your feet. However, in the book of Daniel that Dave read for us for our first Bible reading, Daniel chapter 7, that John's already quoted here in Revelation chapter 1. This son of man figure appears before God, and I thought it would be worth us just having a look at it again. It's there on the screen. Let me read it. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was giving dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So friends, this is a picture of God's king, God's Messiah, being coronated and enthroned, being given authority over, well, everything. And now John sees this same figure, this son of man. In fact, listen to John's description of him in Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. The hair of his head was white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, a sharp double-edged sword coming from his mouth. 
and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. You know, in kids' church, uh, some of you will know, um, the kids are actually doing Revelation as well. And uh, uh, the kids actually drew a picture of Jesus as his represented here. And uh, my son Sebastian came out, he, he, he gave me his picture and he said, look daddy, here's what Jesus looks like in heaven. And that wasn't, that's not quite right. This picture isn't to tell us what colour Jesus' feet are. Rather, each element of this being represents and symbolises something true about who he is. So his white hair, that represents one who is ancient, one who is wise. In fact, in that first reading, it's the Ancient of Days that has hair white as snow. His fiery eyes are an Old Testament symbol of judgment. His pure bronze feet refer to moral purity. His voice like a waterfall, his face shining like the sun. I think these represent glory and splendor and majesty and power. A double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It's another Old Testament reference. From the book of Isaiah, God's word, his word of judgment on the nations was described as a sword. You may know Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. Now the word of God comes out of Jesus' mouth, as you notice. And it comes for the judgment of the nations. This is a picture of a divine being, isn't it? The fact that he's holding stars is kind of the giveaway. This is Jesus as God sees him as he truly is, power and majesty and glory, and it is frightening. And you know, friends, I wonder whether our vision of Jesus can be a little too small, can be a little too docile. If your vision of Jesus is a guy in sandals with flowing brown locks, maybe with a little lamb under his arm, then maybe you need to rethink it. For this Jesus reigns and judges in majesty and in glory and creation trembles at his voice. He is the first and he is the last, enthroned on God's holy mountain. And before this one, before this one, the kingdoms of the world don't seem quite so intimidating, do they? To encourage the churches to endure, even in the face of opposition, God doesn't give them a pep talk. You can do it, guys. Keep going. But rather a glimpse of the risen and reigning Jesus. And secondly, did you notice where Jesus is? He stands among his lampstands. He dwells in their midst. In verse 20, we're told that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Where is Jesus? He's not in some distant galaxy gazing on from afar. But he stands in the midst of his church and his church exists in his presence. And friends, I think that should be a cause of great confidence. Jesus is with us. This Jesus is with us. And we live in his presence. Which means John's response which is terror and understandable, is not quite right. Point three, the one who endures. Have a look with me, verse 17. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and so would I, and so would you. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Do not be afraid, Jesus says. Famously, the most frequent command in the New Testament. Do not be afraid. This divine figure lays his hand upon John, and there's a tenderness here to this picture, isn't there? 
His message is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because I am the first and the last. I was dead. But look, John, see. I am alive forever and ever. He is the living one. The great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously said, God is dead and we have killed him. And you know, for a three-day period, that was absolutely true. But not anymore and not ever again. He holds the keys to death and Hades. If you've got my keys, well, you can come and go whenever you want. In fact, you can control who goes in and who goes out. Death was the great one-way door, but now it's flung wide open. The grave has been plundered and the door has been unlocked. Look, John, I am alive forever and ever. John, there is nothing to be afraid of. Not anymore. Not when I'm here. Not when I have the keys to death. Not when I'm alive forever and ever. And not when I'm on the throne and here with you. Jesus, you see, is the faithful witness. We heard that in verse 5. He's the one who endured. He's the one who stood firm, stood to the end, and now reigns. He endured the pressure, the persecution. He overcame and he conquered. That persecution that John and the church has now experienced, Jesus went through it himself. And for a church that was suffering oppression and violent oppression, we'll, we'll get to know some of these churches in the coming weeks, a vision of the risen and reigning Jesus who endured and overcame must have been of great encouragement. Last part of the passage, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. See, Jesus explains the meaning of the vision. Now, what are the angels? What are the seven angels of the churches? Well, I don't think anyone's totally sure. There's quite a number of theories. One theory is that they actually are the seven planets that you can see from Earth. I think most likely this is a heavenly representation of the earthly church. And so in the next chapter, when Jesus addresses each of the churches, he'll address to the angel of the church in wherever it is. Well, friends, let's wrap this up. A couple of thoughts to conclude. We need not give way to fear. We need not give way to fear. If anti-Christian legislation becomes more prominent, It'll all be okay because Jesus is the one who's really in charge. He's the first and he is the last. And he has authority over the nations. To him, all the governments of the world are subject. Do not be confused as to who the boss really is. It's Jesus and his mighty in power. Friends, if religious extremists take over our country, if ISIS rolls in with their trucks and we're all forced into servitude, be afraid for those who set themselves up against this Jesus. He who are, whose eyes burn with flame and who stands among his people. And should they kill you because of the kingdom of God, like they did to Jesus, not even then, Give way to fear. For that same Jesus who was dead is now alive forever and ever. And he holds the keys to death and Hades and he endured and he reigns. And those who endure will reign with him in glory. How about we pray? Now to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.